So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Art Forum. If you haven't met me, my name is David Sequera, and I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery at the Victorian College of the Arts. And I'm also the person that has um, the absolute pleasure of developing the Art Forum program. And I want to begin the session by acknowledging the traditional landowners of the land on which we're gathered. And um, of course, we have people tuning in from all over the world. And um, for me, I'm located in West Melbourne, which is Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri uh, land of the Kulin Nation. And, you know, in thinking about, um, you know, people who are custodians of land, uh, for, who've been custodians of land for generations before the VCA was even thought of, um, it's actually very moving to, to consider that for generations, people practised song, dance, visual art, ceremony, and that those rituals and traditions even continue today. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and welcome any Indigenous visitors to this Zoom session. To our guest speaker today, Alex Danko. Alex Danko's career spans more than five decades and encompasses sculpture, installation, text and language-based works. Drawing actively on Australia's political and cultural history, his work is imbued with irony, sarcasm and satirical humour. Inserting personal stories, family memories and cultural motifs into the realm of conceptual art, his work can be understood as a critique of cultural institutions and contemporary social values from a domestic perspective. Between 2015 and 2016, the major survey of his work Alex Danko, my fellow Austra aliens, was jointly presented by the Museum of Contemporary Art Sydney and Heidi Museum of Modern Art Melbourne. Alex Danko is an honorary fellow in sculpture at the Victorian College of the Arts. Wherever you are, please make him very welcome. This is the shot of um, part of my studio where I actually start to um, um, present work to myself as kind of finished um, objects or ongoing situations, I'd rather use the word situation than installation. Um, it gives much more greater specificity as we'll see in some of the works that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but before I begin, um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, the, the Jaja Wurrung people in, in, um, in, in the country here where I'm in Dalesford in central Victoria. So I wish to acknowledge the Jaja Wurrung clans as the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, air, and community. And I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so let's, let's go on to the, the next slide, David. Okay, so this was, um, uh, one of the posters that advertised the show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. And it uh, really laid the, the, the kind of theme for the show, as there were a number of um, issues that were raised by calling ourselves Austra aliens, given that we are all Austra aliens in this country. We are all boat people. We are all immigrants, apart from the first peoples who have been here for over 60,000 years. But as, a, as a, a son of migrants who came, came to Australia after the Second World War as, as refugees, and as they were back then, boat people, um, as, but they were legal at that stage. Um, current boat people are illegal, which is a curse on Australia's psyche at the moment, um, with all the people in concentration camps offshore. But let me start with a Ukrainian proverb that um, perhaps gives, gives a kind of light perspective on my fellow Australians. So if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Next slide, please. So this was one of the earliest works in the, the survey show from 1968. Um, in 1968, I was uh, still a student. Well, I'd begun my 
course at the South Australian School of Art in Sculpture. I'd finished my foundation year course and I'll come back to the foundation year course in 1967 um, with um, a work called Art Stuffing. But let me not get ahead of myself. So, bonk forever. To bonk or not to bonk? That is to bunk. Bonk is bonk. To bonk is to bunk. Is bonk bunk? Bonk is bunk. Bunk, bonk. Bonk, bunk. Bonk, bonk. Bunk, bonk, bunk. Bunk for bonk. Bonk. Um, I'm not sure what Claudia would make of that, but I think that would be an interesting challenge for her. So let's go on to the next slide, David. So I'm sort of starting at the beginning, actually before my own beginning. This is my mother with her friends at the Woodside Army Camp, which was turned into a refugee camp when um, <coughs> refugees arrived into Adelaide in South Australia. And Woodside is a, um, a town in the Adelaide Hills, probably about oh, 50 k's outside of uh, the CBD of Adelaide. So in the shot, we've got uh, my mother on the left-hand side of the screen holding um, a piece of hessian that's being embroidered. And this, this particular um, piece of embroidery was, was in a sense a share embroidery that all these women actually worked on, according to my mother. Um, so let's, let's go on to the, the next, next image, which is actually a detail of the actual cushion. So this is um, the completed, completed um, embroidery. And it's something that I um, grew up with in the, in the family house in Edwardstown in, in Adelaide. And it was only until about sort of late 70s and into the 80s and into the 2000s that I fully recognised the significance of this particular um, piece of work that was done as a kind of communal work that my mother was involved in. And speaks very much about um, the, the Ukrainian background in Ukrainian culture that, I'm, um, that I was born into. And when I began, anal not analysing, but had the desire to actually use this as a kind of um, a point of cultural meditation, I made a whole series of gouaches that were just slightly larger than this cushion that um, took me about one month to make per cushion. So it took me a whole year of about one gouache drawing to interpret this um, per month. and. I asked a, um, a cultural anthropologist, Lydia Rostick, who resides in Adelaide, to give some indication of what the design represents. Um, so I'll read just a couple of passages um, that perhaps give some um, notion of what is, is inherent in this abstraction. So she says, most Ukrainian traditional and national embroidery, like the carpets of Persia, Iran, was and is region specific and originally formed complex symbolic patterns which embodied certain aspects of perceived reality or metaphysical statements. In due time, however, some of the archaic geometrical patterns of cosmological significance were lost, distorted, degraded and superseded, so that many designs acquire simply a sense of an historical tradition or continuity and an expression of collective identity. So that notion of collective identity is very much embedded in this given four women worked on it a perception of belonging to a particular people, later nation, as well as an aesthetic dimension. Originally, embroidery was used in Ukraine mostly on apparel and on ritual cloth, which played an important part in the ceremonies of birth, marriage, death, and the adornment of sacred objects. Um, so Lydia referred to the center of square as the center of the center of the world, where things emanate from. And once you get to the border, you get to this, this notion of the unknown. And I think it was quite sort of interesting that my parents embarked on this journey into the unknown to arrive in this very foreign, foreign country, nothing, nothing like Europe. Um, its landscape was different. Um, its flora and fauna were incredibly different to where they had come from, let alone the kind of trauma they'd gotten through as um, displaced people after the Second World War, um, in part escaping, um, Hitler and his, his armies, and then escaping Stalin and his repression um, through the collectivization of my uh, mother's family farm in particular. So she was 
she actually immigrated to Germany during the war. And my, um, she met my father in, in Frankfurt, where he was working in the American army, and he was a displaced person out of Ukraine. And they both married in 1948 um, in Frankfurt. And then eventually got on a, in 1949, got on a train that took them to, to Trieste in Italy, and then on a boat, and they disembarked in Adelaide. And here we are, and here I am. So next, next slide. So what we have here is the, the first one. This is the beginning of, of this um, series of uh, gouache drawings, cultural meditations. So, the, so this is not um, um, a digital image. This is a highly constructed analog image. Um, the grid is drawn up by hand. So that even, the, even the, the grid itself is, is um, totally mechanical with a ruler and pencil. Um, and then uh, a plot. So there's a, roughly a five mil grid. So each one of those five mil squares is one brush stroke. So that's like talking about, you know, several thousand brush strokes. Um, and in some areas, the color is built up through, through layers. That's why this, these works took a month. The, the works then had um, these captions attached to them. So they have a titles which are drawn from um, Ukrainian folk songs. So this one in particular, you know, refers to my, to my mother's eyes that were, um, so I say, your, and, and from the folk song itself, your eyes are dark as night and clear as day. So we go to the next one, please. And so in this, in this work, um, this is not a, this image hasn't faded. It's been consciously constructed with um, a dash of white gouache to every um, piece of pigment. So you get this kind of misting effect. Um, so, and this, this work is then titled, look how the mist um, spreads across the fields or over the field, sorry. Let's go to the next one, please. And this one is titled, Oh Beautiful Night, and it's done with silver gouache. And so in some of the areas, you can see where it's darker, there's about seven layers of, um, of gouache built up on the surface to give this, this deep luminosity to the, the silver gouache and to contrast with where there are lighter um, applications. Next slide, please. And then this one, um, is titled, The Pine Trees Are Rustling. So this gives you a sense of um, um, the kind of obsessive aspects of my practice. Uh, this body of work um, did take a whole year. And so it was very much embedded in this notion of memory and embedded in remembering um, my childhood, but also trying to make sense of um, my cultural place within within Australia as well. So I've always had this kind of ambivalence. English was not the first language that I spoke. It was a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian when my parents went to the factory to work on double shifts to pay for their first house. Um, I was looked after by a sort of surrogate grandmother and um, she taught me how to read in Russian and um, also made delicious cakes. So let's go on to the next slide please David. So this is me at three at my birthday party, but I'm again surrounded by <coughs> a couple of gouaches. I'm a very happy boy at, at three. I'm the only child, so maybe that's hence my expression. Um, and this particular tableau, this is one work, um, is, is um, titled, and my father sings along with the Red Army Ensemble or the Red Army Chorus and Band um, that are quite famous and still um, through generations still are formed as this band that sing traditional Russian and Ukrainian folk songs. Um, and my father used to sing along, he had the fantastic tenor voice. So he would kind of belt it out with them on, on the stereo. And so I could hear his voice and I'm moving around the house um, um, in my later years and in, when I um, recognized what was going on in, when I was like from 12 onwards, I would hear this fantastic voice. Um, but at this point, I'd, I'd like to um, bring in a couple of memories. And um, Campbelltown Art Centre was putting on a series of dance performers with Ukrainian performers. 
and they um, wrote to various Ukrainian artists um, or of Ukrainian background to write some texts about um, themselves. So this is a, a text from Ukrainian male, Alex Danko, September 2012. Memory one, Ayers Avenue, Edwardstown, Adelaide, South Australia, 1956. I am peering out of a hole in the ground. The hole in the ground is in the middle of a block of land across the road from the family home at 124 Ayers Avenue. When I say I am peering out of a hole in the ground, it is a hole that I dug out of the ground with a constructed roof made of grass and leaf matter. I am peering through a slit slightly above ground level. This is my cubby house at six. Memory two. It is spring 1956. The majority of the blocks of land in our street are still almond orchards. The trees are white with blossom. The scent fills the air. A breeze lingers briefly. A flurry of falling petals, slowness, slowness. I return to my hole in the ground. I'm st I am still peering from the hole in the ground. The street is filled with Russians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Yugoslavs, Germans, Hungarians, Ukrainians, Czechs, Poles, ropes and sticks, and I do not speak as a, a, a English. Next, next slide, please. So out of this, this place of suburbia, um, there was a commission that I was awarded in Adelaide for the South Australian School of Art. And this was a, a submission drawing as part of that submission. So it was to construct a, um, ostensibly a one room house made of bricks. So everything is made of bricks. Um, the windows, the doors, the walls, and which were two coarse bricks and the roof is actually made of bricks. So the whole thing is an internal steel structure that supports that incredible mass and weight pushing down onto the, onto the rest of the building. So if we go to the next slide, this will just um, give you a clearer indication of it. And so in this situation, we have um, this one room building, but in, in a way it becomes a critique of where I grew up, the kind of alienation um, that was part of my, fam my, my family history. Because in, in a way, my parents didn't really integrate with um, Australian society, but they, they cherished this place, which was their new home in Australia, and they built it up and constructed their reality around it. So in, in a way, this, this became their reality, kind of closed off to the rest of the world. And in a, in a way, I was able to escape that earlier. I recognised this was the, the kind of cloying, claustrophobic um, situation of growing in the suburbs, and I had to leave. So when I finished um, art school in 1970 and graduated in 71, I moved to Sydney and um, only visited Adelaide roughly once a year to see my parents for Christmas. So if we go to the next slide, I think you can see where um, some People from the, uh, there were three, three women from the, um, um, the architecture school who, who decided to um, um, act as agents for me in, in terms of doing this kind of uh, satirical sale of the house. So instead of Danko Realty, which is the term used for real estate or, or a collective noun for, for real estate on the market, that became Danko Reality. So this became a, a really ideal first home that was for sale, according to um, uh, the real estate agents, um, uh, Louise, Daniela and Jasmine. So it, it, um, it had no, it obviously it's it really, very good house. It has no, no bedrooms, no shower, no bathroom, and no, nowhere to park your car, no garage. So it was a, really an opportunity for, as a renovator's delight, a solid brick home, no maintenance, close to transport, entertainment, education, because it's located directly in the, in the CBD. The university is right there. So it's ideal for student living and provides versatility and privacy. If we go to the next slide. So they, they set up their their real estate sign and, and spruced it. Um, 
and Erica Green, who is responsible for the commission works at the University of South Australia and is the director of the, the Samstag Museum of Modern Art. Um, she, um, she sent me these slides and that's why I include them because I think the, it's a fantastic take on the building and extends the, the, the sort of uh, uh, atmosphere surrounding this, this building. And if you look at the way this building has been planned, you, you see the kind of terracotta brick um, work that's actually in, in the university structure. So it's very kind of um, integrated and sympathetic to the environment. It's a very Adelaide piece of work. Um, let's go to the next slide. And my fellow traveller, Nigel Lendon, who um, I studied together with at the South Australian School of Art, he was about two years ahead of me. Now, no, it's become quite a respected artist and was part of Art Language in New York when he did a, a Harkness Fellowship back in the 70s, but also um, a, a really key educator in terms of uh, working at art schools and setting up art schools. Um, so he sent me this this year and uh, and captioned, Nobody home. I wonder why. When this building is pulled down, there is actually a time capsule inside that was um, um, in, 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 um, embedded within, within the, the architecture of, uh, of, the, of, of the actual work itself. And um, it, it has a series of uh, Q&As where people were asked what, their, what, what they thought about this notion of home. What, what was their concept of home? And inside there, there's a little, um, uh, cast aluminium maquette or unit that is roughly the same proportions but reduced down in scale that's actually with the time capsule. Um, the various tenants around this building want to get rid of it because it because um, they it Im impacts on their parking they would prefer parking space than art um, so they continue to to lobby for its removal but it stays on so it's been there since it's been there for over 20 years and so the kind of patina and the aging process, as you can see, mold is growing on it. So it's taking on a really interesting character. And I think this is a very interesting part for me, that it's, 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 it's aging like, the, that, like I am aging. Next slide. So to sum up um, life, birth, school, work, death. And that little house again, and that's the little house that's actually, one of them are actually in, in that time capsule. So we'll go to the next slide. So this, this idea of, of um, this kind of diurnal existence, um, this re repetition um, is embodied in this work, which is um, titled Day In, Day Out. And it kind of fits in with a, with a st sort of series of strategies of work that I've continued to make, which where objects, um, or situations speak back at the viewer or speak to the viewer about um, um, whatever. In this case, it's speaking about a, a suburban condition and the life surrounding it. So this, so if we go to the next slide, it just give you a, a greater sense of spatiality. So, this, so these two rooms I'm gonna focus on primarily from the MCA show, um, because it gives you an opportunity to see the kind of uh, way in which I work spatially. So in this space, which is a very large space on the top floor of the MCA, and it's repeated on the other side of the wall through that passageway, um, it, it was a, a really fantastic opportunity just to show this one work. Um, and it took on this in incredible aura of, of um, um, almost like a dystopic landscape um, and the kind of the failure of what the suburbs represent and they continue to represent as failures of um, town planning and the kind of alienation that's perpetuated and perpetrated by those um, sort of sprawling suburbs both um, and, it's an, and it's really a kind of Australian phenomena too so let's underline that in a very particular cultural context. So in this room we've got this this suburb there are um, these little buildings laid out. Um, and then the way this work is lit is with one theatre light. And you can see there on the left hand side, um, on a, you can just coming through those two, two chaise longes, there's a, there's a light which shines onto the, onto the work. And in front of it, there's a colour wheel, but with no, with no colour gels. 
So it revolves around and one of the, the apertures, there are five apertures, one aperture then closes off uh, and turns the whole thing into night. And then the whole thing re-emerges into, into this strange light, into a kind of twilight zone. Next slide, please. And so now we so get another view of this. And so the shadows of the buildings um, just, just don't touch the building behind. So there's a kind of shadowing um, and ghosting behind the buildings as well as up onto the wall. That reflection on the wall was like water moving um, as, if, as if it was after a storm where, where there's, it's like after the deluge. So well, let's, let's move into the other space. So in terms of this, this work, this work is called self-portrait building. Um, and I guess it's a kind of critique of architects and architecture that you know, build themselves up as a kind of, um, as heroes of the urban environment. So here, here I, I am as the, the architect of my own destiny in, in, in a way. And so if we move into the next space, and uh, this, is, this for me is like the chattering room. Um, as the Liberal government likes to refer to um, the, the socialist left or whoever disagrees with them as the chattering classes or the Chardonnay socialists. So in this particular work, there are, there are a number of works that are brought together through time. Um, as, as Dave was saying, that this particular exhibition was 2015, 2016. Um, it allowed me to actually um, curate my own work. So I have to say that um, there were some really important things about this show and some lesser things, but I won't dwell on them. So in the end, I became my own cu curator for the show. I designed the show. I worked with all the install crew to make this show happen. It took something like um, two, two, roughly three years in the making to from when I was um, given the invitation for the show to, to start looking at what works would work in those spaces. Uh, working from their plans, etc. So these two rooms became you know, the kind of pivot for the whole exhibition and which revolved around this, this idea of um, a suburban context or about life in Australia. So the next slide, please. So yes, yeah, so here we turn everything into fun to kill time. So again, this house motif, which continues um, through the practice. And so this is kind of spinning house and a very kind of disturbed um, suburb of houses on this side. Um, it, 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 it's about the things that occur inside that you never see, but sometimes it's a topsy-turvy world. So here we turn everything into fun to kill time. Next slide. So that work was from 2003. Um, the work in the centre is called t -t 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 Air off the top of my head. There's also, a, which is from 1975. There's this chatter flag, which is from 2012-13. And the, the wall works um, are from uh, the, the work titled, um, Songs of Australia, volume 16. Shh, go back to sleep an un-Australian Dobbin mix. And for those who are not familiar with the term Dobbin, it means to report a person to someone in authority for wrongdoing. <clears throat> and it's something you don't do, a, you don't do it to a mate in Australia. Um, so it's, a, it's like a, an, an ironical twist twice. So all the, the, the drawings that um, are on the walls, there's something like about 270 of them, so we couldn't fit them all in, but there's at least over 200. And, and if we have the next slide, please. So on these, um, so all these little quips, all these little slogans, all these words um, were garnered from and gathered from uh, things that politicians said, comedians said in, at, at those times when I was making this work. And the Songs of Australia series uh, began in 96 with the election of the John Howard government and ended in, ended in 2007 when they were voted out. And, and um, Kevin 07 or Kevin Rudd came into power as prime minister with the Labor Party. Um, but just give you a, a flavor of, no, we'll go back to the other one, please, David. 
I'll just read out some as well. So the other thing that was actually in this space was an audio track of uh, a radio announcer called Robbie McGregor, who has a very, um, uh, very kind of interesting voice, a very ironical twist in, in his tone, which I'm tr I'll try and mimic. So you had that playing in the background. So as you were listening to these quotes being read out by him, you were reading them as well. So you were kind of listening and reading. Uh, which I quite like to pick up from what Ian Byrne did in an exhibition once, which we, where he titled it, Looking at Seeing and Reading. So in, in terms of looking and seeing and reading, you're hearing as well. So, as bright as bright can be, men shouldn't cry. Caring, comfortable and relaxed. Another wicket's fallen. 37 more pages of sport. There must be something somewhere. Hell for leather because near enough is good enough. Atavistic throwback. Rub some of my luck on you. In your dreams. You know what I mean? Dream on, dream on. This is as good as it ever gets. Minimalist model. Bucket loads of extinguishment. Black armband, white blindfold. The bush. Not a problem. If everything is beautiful, nothing is beautiful. Ordinary Australian ordinary Australia. Here we turn everything into fun to kill time. I hope you are all right in these difficult times. Bugger, we are attractive. Ooh, bugger, what the hell is normal? Ooh, bugger me, I'm happily dishonest. GST on fun, sweet political enjoyment of the most exotic kind, paralyzed by choice. Wherever you go, there you are. Next slide. So in this work, this is the work, um, uh, ch 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 and the little sign at the top says air off the top of my head. I think you can just read that. Um, so this is again, coming back to how I mentioned earlier that uh, how my works you know, speak back to the viewer. So they're looking at the work, but then the, 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 the work is attempting to speak to them as well. The language is there, um, wordplay, etc., and there's a kind of phonic thing here in terms of the chits um, chattering away, and and so one the viewer moves th through this chatter and thinks, you know, off the top of my head, what is this? Next slide. And as part of this um, work, which I haven't mentioned yet, there was a, a blow up of um, the Australian citizenship test, and this one. This particular test was written by um, Catherine Devney in August 29, 2007. I'll perhaps just read a, a, couple, of, a couple of sections. There were, um, it was titled Australian Citizenship Test and it's time for a real test that requires real Australian qualities and you can put values after that as well. I'll just read a couple of, and the, the categories were language, customs, food and culture. Uh, but I'll just read language and customs. One, again, this is, this is for um, immigrants coming to Australia. Language, do you understand the meaning but are unable to explain the origin of died in the ass? Two, what is a mole? Three, are these terms related? Chaka siki, chaka spaz, chaka yui. Four, explain the following passage. In the Arvo last Chrissy, the Rellos rocked up for a barbie, some bevies and a few snags. After a bit of Bex and a lie down, we opened the prezies, scoffed all the chockies, bickies and lollies. Then we drained a few tinnies and mum did her block after dad and Steve had a barney and a bit of a biffo. Then we come to customs. This is really, really, really important for uh, immigrants or newcomers to Australia refugees. Macca, okay, Customs 1, Macca, Chuka and Wanga are driving to surfers in their Tirana. If they are travelling at 100 kilometres while listening to Barnsey, Farnsey and Akadaka, how many slabs will each person on average consume between flashing a brown eye and having a slash? 2. Complete the following sentences. A. If the van's rockin', don't bother. B. If you're going home in the back of a C, fair suck of the 
three. I've had a gutful and I can't be fagged. Discuss. Four. Have you ever been on the giving or receiving end of a wedgie? And five. Do you have a friend or relative who has a car in the front yard up on blocks? Is his name Keith and does he have a wife called Cheryl? Next slide, please. And so the, I'll finish off with this um, homily version of day in, day out. And this comes from my, my father when um, they, were, they were getting into their kind of twilight zone as, as pensioners. And uh, so again, it's the little house um, in cast aluminium on a um, galvanized sheet shelf bracket. And the, the homily, which normally would be like a home sweet home um, phrase that you would have hanging up in your house. But in this case, it, in quotes, as you know, we are pensioners, day in, day out, 24 hours closer to death. And in brackets, Russian humor, Alexander Danko Sr., Adelaide, 1991. So let's move on to the next one, thank you. Okay, um, there are many of, the, many of these alter egos. Um, so this is, this is Uncle Al. So, So, Alex is better able to think when he keeps the special spot on his head slightly warmer. A is by B. B is down on C. C is up D. D is through E. E is from F. F is within G. G is without H. H is at I. I is like J. J is in K. K is on L. L is out of M. M is between N. N is under O. O is before P. P is during Q. Q is after R. R is against S. S is towards T. T is across from U. U is along from V. V is around W. W is about X. X is beside Y. Y is upon Z. And Z is into A. While A is so wanting to say, what is the point? Next slide, please. So it's the other, the other work that was really uh, <clears throat> very popular from Instagrammers was this particular work um, called Selfie Portrait Number One. And uh, it's, it always made me wonder when I saw them on Instagram um, with the person who took the photograph, if they had bothered to read what the actual uh, mirror had said. Okay, selfie portrait number one. It's such a thin line between clever and stupid. So maybe I'll just leave it at that. Next slide. So going back to um, the end of my art school days and uh, when I had my first exhibition um, with the poet Richard Tipping, it was uh, sort of a, a dual show, um, both involved in language. Um, and the show was called UCK, and we made these stencil posters that um, uh, were up about A1 size and uh, plastered the city with them. And then people could actually finish off the, the, the title of the show. Um, so there could be like uh, suck, duck, cluck, fluck, etc. Um, but what this, and so what this was probably a, a key. Uh, edition and I started making editions of work um, back in 1970 and so this particular work is a really important one um, it, it has, has wheedled its way into various collections around around Australia um, there's one of these in, in I think virtually every um, state collection so they've all found a good home um, the NGV in, in uh, Melbourne has one as well what what they what they have inside though and it was revealed to the curators um, back at the NGV when on a, on a very boring day with not a little action, they, they un unstitched the top of the bag and they, what they found inside were my first year uh, foundation year 
life drawings. They flatten them all out, they had a look at them, then they scrunched them back in and put them back in the bag and sewed the bag up. Um, it, so that would have been a complete violation of any conservation um, and artworks by actually undoing the, the, art, the artwork in that particular way. Um, in 1968, there was a really important um, exhibition that I saw as a student, and it was um, uh, a work of Marcel Duchamp's work. And it was um, the Mary Sisler collection that sort of just was went underneath the radar in Australia. No one knew really who Duchamp was. Duchamp in 68 was still alive and he died probably a month after I saw the show. Um, so it was a really key collection. It was even offered to, I think, an Australian gallery and they refused. Um, silly then. But in this shot, I have, in a sense, been returned to. In a sense, I had been stuffed by Marcel Duchamp and now I'm stuffing Marcel um, as I continue to stuff myself with art history. So there's a lot of stuffing going on, um, both as students and as lecturers. Um, and sometimes it's hard to hold that, all that stuffing in when you're trying to teach as well, I must admit. But anyway, we, we stuff on. Uh, so in this case, there are the bag of stuff, stuffing is in very good company, as I say, at home and ready made. In the front, we've got Marcel Duchamp's bicycle wheel and the bottle rack um, behind it. Both of those from the um, uh, National Gallery of Australia collection, so that at least they, so at least they managed to um, be ahead of the game, so to speak. And it was from an exhibition that Max Delaney curated at um, Monash University Museum of Art, which was called Reinventing the Wheel, the Ready-Made Century. So let's move on and um, and during my first uh, uh, year at, at, uh, in Sydney, I did this Laughing Wall collaboration with printmaker Colin Little. And then it grew into a performance at the MCA in 2015. So we'll go on to that. And uh, so this was part of a performance workshop that I held at the, um, with, uh, with teachers, art teachers from high schools. Um, there were about 15, 16 of them, maybe a bit more. And uh, we did this, this, this kind of protest, laughing protest, which was called, you might as well laugh, mate, there's nothing else to do. And uh, we uh, had sort of stations of the cross, so to speak, at various places along Circular Quay, that we left the MCA and just stopped at various places and then, then, and then laughed. And this particular um, teacher managed to rope in some Chinese tourists. And so they, so if we go to the next slide, I think it's fantastic, where they um, participate as well. So what we have is, <laughs> so everyone's kind of making this incredible loud belly laughing sound. And uh, the Chinese were, were very good. Uh, the, they, they joined in with, with, with complete commitment. Um, so let, let's go to the next slide. So I'll leave you on this note. So when I grow up, I'm going to be an artist. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, we've probably got time. I'm just going to have a look at the Q&A. We've probably got time for a, a couple of questions. Um, firstly, actually, before we go to questions, just a really big thank you to you, Alex. You know, it's such a big task to condense a practice of five decades into a very short period of time, but you, <laughs> you did that so beautifully and, and took us through those main themes. So thank you. Um, this first question is, um, Alex, how do you treat memory? How do you tackle it? Well, I, th I think I've tried to indicate some, some of it by um, um, the <clears throat> um, some cultural meditations, which is, I think, exemplified through, you know, spending a whole year thinking about my cultural background, really thinking about my parents, who, you know, um, when I was making that work in 2005, uh, were, were no longer with us. Um, and the, the house where I grew up was sold. The only things that were taken from the house was an, this very old bag full of incredible memorabilia, not memorabilia, but um, uh, fragments of memory, photographs, which my parents never talked to me about. Mm -hmm. But in, in a way, working with that cushion um, activated a whole range of things to do with memory and about growing up in Adelaide and um, art, my art education, but also, uh, my life as an artist, um, 
and what it means to be an artist. And that notion of memory is, is something that as all artists refer to in some way or another. There's a, always a sense of the autobiographical embedded in our work, even though it could be just a black square. You know, I think that, that's something that um, um, one should never shy away from because every day in our life is another day or step in our memory mm. or building that memory. Um, another question from Ashley, and uh, that question is, he's interested in the, the history of mirror, um, you, the use of mirror in your in works, and sure. thinking about Ian Burns' mirror works. Um, how did people interact with these kinds of works before Instagram, like the contemporary selfie? I wonder if you, if you could comment about, you know, life with conceptual mirror works prior to Instagram. Well, there's a... There's a um... I should, I should have probably shown an early work of mine, which was from 1971, <clears throat> which got re-editioned a couple of times, and which was roughly the same size as the mirror work that we saw, um, which is roughly um, uh, A3 size. Um, and it was a mirror, but, in, but in, engraved on a plaque and attached to the mirror was the word autorealism. So there was this, this again, play about um, autobiography or portraiture and so one could look in the mirror and in a sense um, commit a, a portrait um, or it's about a portrait occurring a portrait in that time or in that moment so that that was a really important earlier work of mine that used mirrors um, mm -hmm. I haven't done a lot of them although I've done more of these more of these selfie portraits which um, uh, which I didn't show there was uh, ones that followed um, selfie portrait number one, uh, I give you nothing, nothing stupid beyond this point. And the, the most recent one done this year is warning, objects in mirror are dumber than they appear. Great. Um, one more question, and we might leave it after this question, and it's okay. from Linda. And she says, it's interesting that the Hessian bag used for the art stuffing um, for the art stuffing work, refers back to your mother's embroidery on Hessian cushion, on the Hessian cushion. That's a nice picture. And, and um, in some ways, your work seems like a yearning for mother or land. And she wonders, could you comment on that? Well, I, th I, think, I think that's a really fantastic perception. I think in terms of ma the materiality, the connection of materiality, I think is a wonderful um, um, you know, bow to draw in terms of that time's arrow. I think that's a fantastic um, connection. I hadn't actually recognized that. So I thank Linda for that observation. Um, but yes, the, I guess that um, there was a closeness to, to, to my mother, but also um, it got to a point where I started to develop a closeness to my father. So it's a closeness to both of them, but after they both passed away. So that's why that um, th those gouaches became a really important um, important and emblematic in that in that way of um using memory or activating memory or using memory as a as a as a memoriam and you know goes without saying a yearning for for things which were unsaid alex we're gonna we're gonna leave it there before i uh wind up i, I do want to thank everybody for the questions that are pouring in we'll pass those questions into alex thank you again to my colleague um Ash Perry for, for facilitating this and to Georgina Bins from our research library, who's posted, um, you know, there's, there's a number of resources around Alex um, in the library and you can access those via the link that Georgina's provided. But um, a really big thanks to you, Alex, for, for taking the time and the care to take us through um, that, that journey from your personal experiences, the only, the only child, the, the picture of the three-year-old, right through to its implications in the development of conceptual art over a period of time from the 60s, right through into the 21st century. It was, um, you know, incredibly fulfilling and, and frankly, um, sort of luscious to, for, for us to be part of that parallel of development in, in Western art and your own development. So thank you. Thank you so much for the generosity. Can I, can I just thank you, David, and thank, you, thank everyone who had come in on board to, for this art forum. Um, and, um, and, and thanks to Ashley Perry as well in helping set this up. 
Um, I'm still a novice in terms of uh, uh, doing these sorts of online things, but I think it went incredibly well. And that's due to, to both um, to Ashley and yourself, David, that <laughs> goes without saying. Um, and uh, I just want to just perhaps put a last footnote to all this and say that we as Australian artists should be looking into our own backyard perhaps more often too. We seem to ignore um, our own, um, our own people, our own artists. Um, we seem to always reference, and I'm at fault at doing this as much as anyone else in a teaching situation, we're always referencing overseas people. We need to reference our own people, our indigenous culture and indigenous artists, both um, uh, ones who work in say remote areas in Australia, as well as urban areas, as well as other, other people of um, different um, cultures and, um, um, and, and people from other sexualities as well. So we need to be much more inclusive and embracive of our, of our own and more often. Mm. I'd, I'd like to end it on that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alex. And thank you to everyone who's participated. Our speaker next week will be Greg Creek. Um, and I look forward to joining you all then. Thank you very much. Goodbye from Art Forum. Thank you. Thank you.